Hello everyone. My name's Melinda Martin and I'm the Gallery Director at Linden New Art. Welcome to Linden New Art's event, Strange Bedfellows. The event pairs two speakers addressing completely unrelated subjects, followed by questions from you, the audience. During the first part of the program, the presenters share their specialised knowledge in a short and sharp 20 minute lecture. We get to listen and learn. But during the Q&A, anything can happen as the audience seeks to find the connections. Both speakers must answer the questions that you ask, even if it isn't their specialised topic area. So gather your friends, grab your family, prepare to learn some weird and wonderful facts and compete to see if you can come up with the winning question. A prize will be awarded to those with the best questions or connections. But by now, you've, entered, you've come along to a few virtual events from home, but we wanna make sure that everyone feels welcomed and well-informed and how this event is going to proceed today. I suggest you grab a glass of something and maybe some suitable snacks. The af this afternoon, we're coming to you live on YouTube and Facebook. If you're watching us live and you'd like to make a comment, you'll need to log into the platform you're watching us from. We would love to hear from you. We will bring your questions up on screen after the presentations. For accessibility, we have live captions available by live Facebook Live, and we have two Auslan interpreters with us today, Mark and Paul. Also, a note, there could be some strong and colourful language used in this presentation, so it might be best to distract those little kids with something else when we get to that. And as I mentioned, the best question or connection will be awarded a prize. Up for grabs tonight is a Hendrix gin pack, including a bottle of Hendrix gin, Hendrix glasses and tonic to get you started for summer. Of course, you have to be over 18 to win and collect this prize. Simply click on the say something or write a comment box at the bottom of the live chat area to get started. If you're watching through a TV, well, you're just a little bit too clever, but chatting gets a bit complicated. So we recommend that you chat through a computer, tablet, or mobile device. Before we begin today, strange bedfellows, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we all virtually meet this afternoon. Today, I'm joining you from the lands of the Woiwurrung and Wurundjeri people here in Melbourne. Our guest, Anna Power, is beaming in from the lands of the Wurundjeri people, also of the Kulin Nation in Melbourne, and Minnie Cooper, is joining us from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation in Sydney. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And while we meet virtually this afternoon, tonight draws upon the ancient history of this land and it reflects the millennia of experiences of First Nations people coming together to celebrate, to make art, to learn from each other and to connect. I'd also like to extend a very warm welcome to all First Nations people who may be joining us today. Today we have a very special program where we'll learn all about the history of mid-century modern, how it started and how Australian designers responded to this international movement. And drag queens, we'll hear one artist's personal journey to drag and of course see a performance because you can't talk drag queens and not have a song and dance number. I'm already intrigued and especially interested in the connections that you, our audience, will make. From modernism to mid-century modern, we'll cover it all and more, and then we'll step into the world of drag queens, where I'm sure we'll add a few sequins. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker, Anna Power. Anna has a passion for great design and is the principal architect of Studio Esther an architecture and interior design firm based in Melbourne. Anna also works as a part-time sessional teacher at RMIT's University's Faculty of Architecture and Design. Prior to establishing Studio Esther, Anna held positions at SJB Architects and Bates Smart Architects, where she worked on the award-winning Royal Children's Hospital here in Melbourne. Anna has also worked with Alexander Tazans and Associates, the University of New South Wales, the University of Sydney, 
and Stanick Harding Architects. As a graduate architect, you worked with a number of firms in Hong Kong, including Design Two Architects and Planners, and Peter Fung and Associates. Anna, welcome to today's Strange Bedfellows. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's really lovely to have you. We're going to bring up a presentation on screen now and we're going to get you started to talk about mid-century modern. I'm going to yes. hand over to you, Anna. Thank you. Um, look, it's a big topic, mid-century modernism, but I'm going to have a go at it in 20 minutes. And I think what I really want to um, help everyone do is perhaps contextualise it. So we sort of understand mid-century modernism as a, a period, a style that originates post-World War II and has certain features that run across it and, and through, you know, internationally. But let's start at the beginning, which is really not the beginning, but the beginning of modernism. So our next slide shows this, what modernism came in in the late 1800s as a very strong far-reaching movement. So it was driven by designers, it was driven by artists, it was driven by writers, creative people who were looking at a new way of representing um, art and architecture and, and culture. So it was heroic in its um, what it was trying to achieve. Our first um, image, Walter Gropius started the Bauhaus School in Germany in 1919. He talked about starting from zero. We see a, a, a school that reimagined a material world that encompassed and unified all of the arts and we get the chair next coming from that as well. So we've got a whole different style going on all of a sudden. We've moved away from the, the stodgy, decorative, elite architecture and design that was only affordable for wealthy people. And if we look at the next slide, we see that modernism then becomes even bigger and we end up talking about an international style. So we end up with this new look to all of our design and an idea that we have it unified across the world and everyone can afford and be part of this heroic movement. In On this slide, we're looking at Walter, I'm um, sorry, um, Mies van der Rohe. On the far right, we have the German pavilion from the International Exposition in Barcelona in 1929. So you can imagine this with the infamous Barcelona chair designed by Mies that features in the pavilion we had this entirely different way of looking at architecture, at building, at furniture. It was incorporated, it was pared back, it was simple and clean, and it brought a new style of, um, of lifestyle, really, to people. It was um, uh, then we can see that even though that was occurring, in the next slide, there was some that did not want this um, international style. There was a reaction against modernism. So we had this socialism in architecture and design where we, where the architects, designers, et cetera, were trying to share hygienic, clean, modern machines for living. And then in these um, images, we see work for Hermann Goering in East Germany and work for Stalin in Moscow, where there was still a desire to be back with this sort of more decorative, elite, monumental architecture. So that's modernism. It was then exported. So modernism then after, uh, during and after World War II, the movement was dispersed. So we had a lot of these um, strong players in the modern movement going to other parts of the world after the um, after the World War II. We can see then the spread of the Bauhaus style on the far right is Tel Aviv. So there are actually 4,000 Bauhaus buildings in Tel Aviv that were, were um, designed between 1920 and 1940. 
in Australia, we we um, we had Romberg coming here. We had Harry Seidler coming via America. So we had these European experienced designers with strong philosophies going out into um, post World War II uh, Eurocentric countries um, to sort of take this new way of managing things. We had a big building program because there was so much destruction in World War II. So if we look at the next slide, we basically had that modern start, those philosophies. Then coming into post-World War II, they sort of morph into this mid-century modernism. So there's an enormous amount of kind of government money that's being put into rebuilding cities, cultures, infrastructure. You know, we needed enormous amounts of housing. There was an understanding that there needed to be a welfare state. There was a lot of, um, you know, homelessness and um, people had been, um, you know, separated from families, had to leave their home countries, etc. So there was an understanding of a need for a welfare state. But there were also these new technologies. So we'd already had modernism coming out of the Industrial Revolution, but we're moving more into even more urbanisation, uh, new technologies being discovered. So this, again, this kind of quite, um, you know, there was this sort of feeling of hope. New materials were just sort of in, um, invented, I guess. We sort of had plastic coming in in the 60s. We had um, an understanding of how to work with plywood. So there was a desire to sort of mass produce. And again, part of that modern modernist ethos of wanting everyone to be able to have clean and neat and simple, that it was affordable, accessible. But also, um, I think what really characterises mid-century modernism is that there is a move away from the austerity of modern of modernism. So there's a more of an interest in starting to reflect um, a, a local area, so a kind of regionalism, so a desire to sort of maybe knit in more with things that were of a place so that we had more of an interest in that. And we had um, like an interest in vernacular architecture and sort of folk and craft. So those things were actually brought into it as well. So it became a richer, warmer sort of style than perhaps that very austere, really very pared back modernism. Um, so we see in France um, this coming through in this one on the left is Ronchamp Chapel, which was by Le Corbusier, who was a, he was an enormous um, uh, influence with um, modernism. He wrote towards a new architecture, which was this, you know, absolute kind of uh, it, it was all about, um, you know, this machine for living in. But even he's sort of softening, becoming more sculptural in his forms in his later work. We see the beautiful Vitra chair by Jean Prouvé, which is from um, the, the Vitra were operating, making these products in the um, late 30s into the 50s. And then on the right, we have the Unité de Habitation in Marseille. So this was... Um, mass housing again affordable housing sort of thing so but again a more sculptural style sort of coming through um on the next slide we we look at this going through britain so in 1951 the left sh side shows there was a national festival and fair in britain so some hope coming to britain after a very long and difficult world war ii uh, you know, enormous sort of gloom and austerity. So this sort of feeling of hope in the 50s and and some new ideas and, again, beautiful sculptural mass-produced furniture that's so timeless, the mid-century furniture, why it's so incredibly popular now. Um, but also this um, idea, again, of these, you know, mass housing um, design for everyone, affordability, and things were clean and hygienic after people living in, um, you know, older places, a lot of which were bombed in London, say, during World War II. So dealing with that. Just looking at the next slide, we go to Scandinavia, which we often strongly identify with um, their mid-century design. <clears throat> um, on the left, 
uh, a building by Anna Jakobsen, um, also known really so much for his beautiful furniture, um, working where, with the Fritz Hansen um, company to produce it, where they worked out how to sort of steam bend plywood in, <clears throat> in the 30s and produced a number of iconic Jakobsen chairs. Um, there was also Hans Wegner, a, a number of fantastic designers working through the Fritz Hansen um, <clears throat> banner. Um, but again, looking at these, we see these images, that timelessness of Scandinavian design. Um, thrown in there, IKEA. IKEA started um, selling and exporting customer assembled furniture in 1948. So IKEA picked up on this idea, mass produce, good design for everyone, employed designers to design the actual um, patterns and um, got it out to everyone in the public. And we understand IKEA is still doing incredibly well these days. Um, Finland, we look at work by Alva Aalto. <clears throat> so again, seeing that modern influence with regard to simpler forms, less adornments, but a warmth, the use of a more um, natural materials, um, more vernacular forms, an architecture that's perhaps more distinguished as being of that country, not the ubiquitous sort of international style of modernism where it could be anywhere kind of thing. <clears throat> uh, the next slide, we look at mid-century modernism in America um, very well known, the case study houses um, of, you know, around California, where John N. Tenza, the editor of the Arts and Architecture magazine, between 1945-1966, employed a number of amazing architects, Richard Neutra, Charles and Ray Eames, Pierre Koenig, uh, Eero Saarinen, to um, put together basically prototypes again, allowing something that was economic and easy to build, affordable, to be had by everyone. So the sharing of great design. Um, <clears throat> Charles and Ray Eames met at the Cranbrook Academy in Michigan. Um, Ray Eames had actually started an architecture degree under Frank Lloyd, um, I think, He'd started one and he'd been very interested in Frank Lloyd Wright, so he didn't enjoy where he was studying and he went over to Cranbrook Academy instead and looked more at industrial design. And he and um, he met his now wife, Ray, his then wife, Ray. Um, Saranen was there as well as was Florence Knoll. So you had a, a group who met at school and got very interested in this really um, easily made stackable furniture, etc. And there's there you have Saarinen's TWA term, terminal. So moving a bit quicker um, <clears throat> into Latin America, we see Oscar Niemeyer, we see um, late modern architect, uh, mid-century modern architecture again, where there's actually an understanding of place. So it's not as pared back, not as like the international style. It's warmer and we see that through the furniture too. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so coming into Australia, all of this influence is coming to us. We've got our televisions, we're watching Bewitched, we're watching James Bond, and then we have um, the Knoll furniture being imported. So you can see we had the 1956 tulip table, which was designed by Saarinen. Um, and made in the US, but we're starting to import all of this influence. So we've got the suburbs of America, the affluence, the beautiful furniture, and Australia is sort of following in step, having seen it on television and picking up on that mid-century modern vibe. So the next slide, um, we see some of our Australian architects and the influences of those um, overseas um, architects and designers and how they're introducing that. So we see a local feel to the architecture. We see the use of local materials, but you can kind of really quickly see the influence of Frank Lloyd Wright um, and then the warmth of that coming through. Um, Seidler was actually a bit of a diehard modernist, so his middle um, Australia Square, he never really kind of got went for all of that mid-century modern stuff. 
going um, really fast now just across. So we see that um, Grounds, Romberg and Boyd worked in Melbourne. We've got the small home service, um, you know, the possibility of everyone having a designed building. We see Robin Boyd's Walsh Street, you know, warm and earthy but clean lines and modern sort of ideals, ICI House, um, the Arts Centre by Grounds and Romberg and Boyd. And then lastly, we look at the next side where we see our project home. So this idea imported that we have this opportunity for everyone to have a beautiful designed um, house for them. We've got the pet, petted and severed houses that were designed by Graham Gunn locally in the 60s. Mel, I think you might have grown up in the middle house. And then we've got um, the merchant builders in the 70s. And our designers, our furniture designers on our last slide, we see these influences coming through into our Australian designs. We've got the Featherston, the Grant and Mary Featherston design on the left. You can see the Jakobsen influence, um, the beautiful, warm, moulded forms of the technology that they could access and also an idea of fitting with the human body, but still that the paired back nature that's come from modernism. So we've sort of got this perfect combination, hence the popularity, I think. Uh, the Parker furniture, incredibly popular, that was made in Sydney. The Fleur furniture, made in Melbourne in the um, third image. And Danish Deluxe in the fourth image. So we can see that all of these influences and this sort of timeline from modernism to mid-century modernism, um, this sort of evol evolution to a, a timeless design that's still incredibly popular to this day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for your conversation and insights into mid-century modern. You've blown my cover. Yes, I did grow up in a uh, mid-century modern home. My parents are uh, were the second um, people to commission the house that we grew up in. Um, so it was uh, a really lovely place to grow up in and I now live in a mid-century place as well. Oh, wow, yeah. So it's continued. Oh, it's they're very continued. timeless. They're very popular, I think. You know, well, we know that they're very popular now, especially when we see real estate prices. Thank you so much, Anna. It was really great to have that conversation. I'm now going to swap over and we'll change tack a little bit and begin the next part of the Strange Bedfellows session. Okay, thank you. In early 2019, the great Australian artist Patricia Piccinini, she came to Linden New Art and she reflected on how her first exhibition at Linden was where the hustle began for her as an artist. So in that tradition of hustling, it's my turn to talk about money. This is the bit where we ask you to support us if you're able to do so. We're offering this event free online as part of the Melbourne Fringe Festival so you can enjoy the experience. But it takes a lot for our small teams to produce this virtual event. So if you can, please think of supporting us. We suggest a figure of $15 or $20 per person if you're in a position to do so. Think of it as buying us a glass of sparkling wine or a round of boutique beers. And of course, if you'd like to add some more zeros to the end of those numbers, we will not say no at all. The link to donate securely is on the bottom of the screen and we'll place it in the chat as well online. And we are sharing all donations that we raise today with our good friends at the Fringe Festival um, because we like to play and share. So please, if you can give, it would be lovely if you could. I'm now going to jump in and talk to and invite you to meet our very next presenter. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Sydney drag queen and entertainer Minnie Cooper. Minnie is a Sydney drag queen icon 
and has produced and choreographed award-winning shows and events such as the Sydney Mardi Gras, Sleazeball and Flash Mobs. She's worked with stars including Jimmy Barnes, Cindy Loper, Kylie Minogue, Tina Arena, Danny Minogue and Australia's most famous drag queen, Carlotta. In 2016, Minnie was a semi-finalist in Australia's Got Talent. You performed for Cher at the 2018 Mardi Gras and for Kylie Minogue in 2019. You've appeared on Channel 7 as one of the judges on All Together Now. In 2018, you performed your one-woman show from Chorus Boy to Leading Lady, and it won the Best in Cabaret and Musical Theatre Award at the Sydney Fringe Festival. Minnie's most recent projects include hosting the online streaming program Live from Stonewall, which was nominated for Best Online Streaming Show by Time Out. Minnie, it is so lovely to have you join um, Strange Bedfellows. I'm feeling very underdressed in comparison. I feel like I should have added a few more sequins. Everyone feels underdressed when they're around me. <laughs> Don't feel special. <laughs> so, Minnie, welcome. It's great Thank pleasure. You. I'm going to hand over to you and you yes. can share your very gorgeous drag story. Oh, will, we see, will I read my story first or will we show my little performance first? I think read your story and then we'll move to your number at the end. Okay, sounds fabulous. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Minnie Cooper. I'm a 49-year-old cross so we'll start with that. Now, it has been said that I was abandoned as a baby and left at the doorway of Ark Nightclub and that I was adopted and raised by drag queens. Well, I think it's about time I put that urban myth to rest. I'm Minnie Cooper and this is my drag story. On Thursday, the 26th of June, 2014, I was given a gift. It was a chance meeting that without, I wouldn't be the Minnie Cooper who you see standing before you today. It does feel very odd to say today, not tonight. Drag is definitely more night friendly, especially when you look like this. <laughs> this person I was about to meet may mean nothing to you, but means everything to me. She is the Tony Award winning actress for playing the role of Adelaide in Guys and Dolls. Her credits are varied and many. The woman was Faith Prince. Go check out her website, faithprince.com. I've only got 15 minutes, so I have to move on. Um, she was in Australia doing concerts at the Sydney Opera House. She contacted ED5, a school where I teach dancing, asking them would they be interested in her teaching masterclass for their students. Fortunately for me, she had no transport to get there. ED5 is in Stratfield, 45 minutes out of the city. I was asked would I drive her there. I was like, let me think about that. Fuck yes! <laughs> I picked her up from Sheraton on the Park in my little Suzuki Alto, which I had cleaned the night before. I asked her why she contacted ED5. She said, I love teaching, giving back, and being able to inspire people and give them the tools I personally use that have helped me with my success. I was amazed to hear someone who I respected and was also fangirling over show so much generosity. That's lesson number one right there, give back. Before I was Minnie Cooper, I worked as a professional chorus boy in musical theatre. Drag was definitely in my blood though. In 1996, I was 25 working on Crazy For You the opening tap number was so fabulous. The girls wore these gayest pink fluffy candy costumes. One night, so many girls were off. With me being the dance captain, knowing the routine, they frocked me up and on I went. Guess who was the prettiest girl that night? Hey! And P.S. The strangest thing happened to the tap shoes. They magically appeared in my bag at the end of the night. They are still the ones I wear today. Thank you, Gordon Frost. I grew up in the western suburbs of Sydney. There was a Granville train disaster, then there was me. Hollywood musicals have always been a big part of my life since I was very young. My love for these movies came from my mum. We would watch them every weekend. I was obsessed. I always say I started drag at around six years old. I used to fantasise being those glamorous women in Technicolor like Anne Miller and Judy Garland. 
I, I would always try to dress and dance like them. So my non-judgmental mum, who never discouraged me from dressing up, she even signed me up for dance classes. It was there I discovered I had this booming voice and natural gift for tap dancing. Even though the rest of my family and pretty much well everyone else thought it was wrong for a boy to dance and dress up like a girl, my mother never discouraged me as she saw it gave me joy. What more can you ask of a parent who loves their child unconditionally and lets them live their authentic self? As I got older, I became more aware. I stopped with the cross-dressing because it wasn't normal. The only gay man I ever remember seeing was Tim Curry as Frankenfurter. I was like, is that a what, what I am? Well, yes. But at the time, I found it quite scary. When I was in my teens, AIDS was all over the media. The Grim Reaper ad, Rock Hudson dying. Rock was the name my brothers used to call me. It was around that I started having those thoughts, something was wrong with me. When I was 15, my mum's brother, Uncle Neil, passed away. We were told he died of cancer. At the funeral, my mother was crying in such pain. I'd never heard a cry like that before. It was gut-wrenching. My mum said Auntie Lorraine told her Neil didn't die of cancer, but AIDS. I remember it as clear as I am standing here now. It was in that moment I decided I was never going to tell her I was gay, let alone do drag. I would never want to cause my mum such pain. I also remember at 16 looking in the mirror, feeling so much shame, crying, think who would want to love someone like me? I really thought of ending it. That is why positive representation is so important and why I love drag race. Not just because it shows the world what a fabulous art form drag is, but also that some boy like me will watch that show and that it's okay to be who they are and they are not alone. My first boyfriend, William Forsyth, yes, I've had a boyfriend. It was through him I was introduced to the gay world of Oxford Street. William was a dancer on the strip and choreographed the drag shows and Mardi Gras parties. I would go watch him perform at the midnight shift on a Wednesday night in Transformers. I was transfixed by these manly but magical creatures. A quiet little voice inside me was saying, I would like to do that. Through the next 10 years, I would also become a part of the drag scene, choreographing shows for Mitzi McIntosh and Chelsea Bunn. I would occasionally frock up and go out socially. I thought I was beautiful, but I looked more like a big toe. This year, I'm celebrating 20 years since I did my first paid gig as a professional crossdresser. It was on this night that I had the taste of really being a drag performer. I realised I wanted to entertain people instead of my current job being a chorus boy where I was just basically moving scenery. In 2003, I was in between jobs. Chelsea Bunn asked me would I work with her at the King's Cross Hotel. I was like, sure, I'm in between jobs and 18 years later, I'm still in between jobs. Thank you, Chelsea Bunn, for offering me that job. It's given me a career I never thought I'd have and I'm so grateful and I wouldn't change it for anything. 14 years later, when I drove up to the Sheraton to pick Miss Prince, I was now a full-time working drag queen. I could not have been busier. I had stopped singing and dancing. All my performing life I had worked for other people, but had not really done anything for me. Faith Prince started her masterclass by talking about guys and dolls. When at first she didn't actually get an audition for the role of Adelaide, her agent was told she wasn't right and it was basically a waste of her time. She felt like she was born to play this role, so she called the producers and they said, and she said, I really want to audition. They agreed. She performed the song that she did for her audition, excuse me, <clears throat> it was captivating. When she finished, she said, I'm not the best singer, but I'm a great storyteller. And I thought, hmm, that's me. If it wasn't for asking to get an audition, she never would have won that Tony Award. Lesson number two, always ask for what you want, but respect the answer and don't have a sense of entitlement. 
I've had all these things I wanted to do, but I was never asked or had the opportunity to show what I was capable of. She actually gave me permission that it was okay to ask. Lesson number three, fuck all those other bitches and start doing things for you. After meeting Faith, I created Drag to Riches, mentoring young drag talent. Lesson number one, me giving back. I started singing again when approached to host the Diva Awards. I asked if I could do an opening number, which led to the iconic Anything Goes performance. Lesson number two, always ask for what you want. Australia's Got Talent and my cabaret shows. Lesson number three, fuck all those other bitches. Putting all those things into practice has given me so much joy. Also a career even I'm jealous of it. I just like to say, thank you, Miss Prince, for giving me these gifts. I was able to achieve things I never thought I would. Sometimes you just gotta have a little faith. One other date, which is big for me, is August the 9th, 2017. It was the day the plebiscite was announced. It took me back to my 15 year old self and I realized I still carried all that shame about being gay and doing drag. I wish I understood at 15 what I know now. Shame has really stopped me from having the best possible relationship with the person who loves me unconditionally, my mother. From that day onwards, I started to be kind to myself and talking about my shame to set me free of it. I haven't always been the best son because of it, but things are definitely getting better. I know she would be so proud and I look forward to the day I can stand in front of my mum and say wholeheartedly, I am what I am. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening, everyone. <laughs>
those days we just lay around on grinder. <laughs> Flabby, fat and lazy, we got bumped and bumped a daisy. And let's face it, we need a job. <laughs> It's a guess, it makes a lie, well I'll be blessed Quite important, thank the Lord, I had my niggas freshly pressed You deserve to do what me, yes my dear, that's fine with me What's the matter, doll, you nervous? Don't worry, I supply full service amazing as well thank you paul i was love watching you <laughs> i feel paul may may should have really added a few sequins to his uh interpretation next maybe, time paul next time maybe he's more of a modernist fan though probably mm -hmm. i'm now going to bring back our um present other presenter anna and we're going to get to the audience questions and uh, Linda will bring them across the screen to us. I know I've got a number of questions that I've been responding to in the comments and I'm getting some really lovely comments. Um, fantastic performance from Fiona Brand, who's been coming up with some really great questions throughout, um, throughout the uh, uh, presentations. So Linda, do you wanna start with the very first? If a drag queen was a modernist building, what would we name the building? Anna, do you want to go first? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, what would we name the building? I think it's quite easy, Mini Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really happy with that. But, um, yeah, I think... Um, you know what, Anna, you know what my first drag name was? Anna Friend. Oh, there That's you go. You should just say Mini Cooper and a friend. So you can take that if you like. Feel free. <laughs> okay. Well, um, yeah. Um, are we still waiting for me to think of something really well, great? Yeah, come on, Anna. Okay. <laughs> we could name a building. Um, look, it would have a kind of, well, let's give it a, something fairly European, like a, a Lola and then throw in a kind of, um, yes, Lola <laughs> <laughs> You're right across it. See the yeah, it's gotta have the double meaning, but yeah, something yeah, um um oh you're leaving me here hanging out. You no no, I think Hannah, that's really quite great. I think, I think it's good, I think it's fabulous. Um Mini, you would call the building after your own name or would you come up with oh, another absolutely. name? Look at <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think this comes from early on in the presentation, Anna, when we were looking at the Barcelona chair. Oh, yeah, yeah. And can no, I just I say, so when we were looking to promote this uh, particular event, trying to find the perfect image of a drag queen and mid-century modern furniture proved impossible. Mm. So I'm very keen for the answer to this question. My home is full of Ikea. 
<laughs> so, how many drag queens do you think could fit on a Barcelona chair? Uh, I think that you, oh, okay, many, good, all right. I would say turn it upside down and say four. Oh, okay. What about you, Anna? Yeah, look, I think that, you know, you've got to look at, um, you know, the Barcelona chair hadn't got stackable yet, but I think we can start stacking onto it. So, yeah, <laughs> how many how many drag queens can you stack? And then we'll stack them because it's a nice big, you know, it's got a really nice broad base. It can take How it. much weight can it take? It depends on the weight. Oh, uh, yeah, it's pretty good. It's like bent steel, so it's um, it can take a fair bit of weight. Oh, I'd say um, 10 then. Yeah, ten? no, it's definitely, yeah. I feel also there should be a couple who are glamorously draped around the back of the chair as well, around the oh. ten who are on top of each other. I think that would be the best the best way to go. Well, there's a beautiful oh. sculpture in the Barcelona um, pavilion that's always like on the water at the back, so there's definitely opportunity to put a sort of series of beautifully <laughs> arranged. Um, oh, yeah, I'm up for that. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely it's a beautiful setting. With the green okay. arms. Linda, what's our next question? Oh. Ooh. Anna, mm. so what outfits could drag queens make with new plastics and plywood materials? Well, I mean, look, plywood's so bendable. Like, it's a fantastic sort of um, structure. So you can definitely restructure your whole shape body you know something that's really and then draping that in plastic yep perfect lots of opportunity but definitely with plywood it's got a lot of structural bendy oh if it bends that's even better because i made outfits out of toy bikes from a kid's shop i made an outfit out of you know cards um you, go, you can make oh, it out, okay. out of it. Yeah. It's all, it's all to do just with your creativity and what you're willing to use all the, yeah. There's some things you can't use, but I've used I've used a lot of plastics before. Yeah, I think like they're both sort of really moldable, so you can make nice kind of really rigid, proper sort of costumes that can kind of. Did you make a nice corset with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, there we go. And the shoes, you know, stacking up that plywood. Oh, perfect. Shaped them like this. You could have them this high, you know. Hi, the shoe, hi, God. I think they're both incredible answers. I don't know what I would say to that, but I'm looking forward to Minnie seeing you in a very glamorous plywood um, frock coming up soon in one of your mm. next performances. Don't hold Linda, have we? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Linda, have we got any other questions? I've got my um, plywood. There you go. Mm. I thought it'd make a great headdress, actually. Yeah, that's a nice kind of Ikea plywood, you know. Yeah, you can make a headdress out of thing. that. Stick it on the side. Perfect. Um, Fiona asks, what do you think is the most common link internationally being between drag and modernism? We both go uh, to Bunnings to build things. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think there's an enormous link, though, between the beginnings of cabaret and, like, all the yeah. underground stuff that was going on during the war. You know, there was huge amount of, um, uh, you know, people were living for the moment and that was really the birth of modernism and everyone, you know, felt um, that they could, you know, get out there and have a great time and, you know, people were much more liberated, a lot less uptight in some ways. Well, it was interesting when you brought up when you brought up Bewitched and all that sixties era because drag loves that like that yeah, era, yeah. that sixties, especially because that's when Carlotta really came was in the sixties. Like girls, yeah. it's all very that time, very much but so. Yeah, like the twenties and you know all of that time oh. and you know when they're in and all of France, you know there was a real yeah. sort of like live for the day. There was so much yes. kind of. Him. And it was only in the 50s, sort of post World War II, that it got a bit, things got a little bit, um, you know, everyone went back to the suburbs quietly, but not for long. Yeah. No, not, not, for, not for long. You know, the 60s. Then we had the 70s. And... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. 
Um, thank you. I think that's a great question, Fiona. And Linda, have we got one more question? So Juliet Hansen, who I'm going to blow her cover, she's actually our curator at Linda New Art, and she is wondering how each speaker would respond to the phrase, less is more. Anna, would you like to go? <laughs> I've got my answer. <laughs> Oh, look, it's always been, um, you know, I do know, of course, we always sort of that came down to that pairing back in modernism. So, yes, definitely this sort of idea, you know, and as Robin Boyd, sort of the Australian ugliness, too much featureism, you know, we just keep everything simple and paired back. But, you know, there's definitely if that if that ends up being a good backdrop for, you know, Mini, that's working then because that's really, you know, if everything was well, that produced, it would be a pretty dull world. Well, I mean, what I say, less is more and more is not enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. No. Um, yeah, good for some buildings and backdrops, but not, not for everything. Not so good for drag queens, though. No. <laughs> Uh, Juliet, great question. I hope you uh, love the answers that you've got both from Anna and Minnie. We've also got a great question um, from someone called Emily, which is, what style wig would a mid-century modern building wear? Oh, I wish I could bring up a picture. <laughs> you keep talking, I'll find a picture. Well, that is the thing. Like, I, I think that a mid-century modern um, would be happy to have a pretty, um, a beautiful, big, you know, colourful wig, but, you know, still fairly, um, you know, nicely styled. Oh, nice. <laughs> yes, yes. What do you yeah. think of that? Yeah. Structural. Yeah. But shape. Neat. You know, but it's got a bit of character, not too austere, not too sort of yeah. pared back. Yep. And that's um, the 60s. That's 60s. Soft. like. Yeah. Yep. Oh, that's actually my, my dress I made out of Uno cards, actually. You know how I said I made a dress out of Uno cards? That's oh it. Oh, my God. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Oh, I'm very talented. <laughs> <laughs> and modest. <laughs> Um, and I think we've got another question um, from Stacey Taylor and I'll bring that across the screen now. Do you think it's true that drag artistry, like mid-century modernism, reflects a sense of one's place in the world? Yes, I do. And I actually believe, like, you look at Priscilla Queen of the Desert, I, like, look at that as part of our psyche of even our country, that film. Do you know, it was a place in a time of the, especially the 90s. I think it, that that movie itself is a reflection of our, especially the Sydney culture and what yeah, it yeah. was at that time. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and, and that's the whole thing. Yeah. That That's where, like, it was all about getting away from this sort of international style and looking at, like, regional. And when we were talking yes. about it and I was thinking about it, it's about identity, you know, like it, yeah. you know, it's really strong, that sort of idea about identity. So I and think that's a that's strong it. commonality. And, you know, it's interesting when you were talking about buildings and how, uh, like, you know, even our designs in Australia, Australian designers, drag is like that as well because it's dictated by the people that live it. So it's always yeah. different. Wherever you are in the world, it's dictated by the people that lead it. Uh, would yeah. you, think, would yeah. you agree with that? Yeah, no, that's right. That's what I was sort of thinking about, about identity and that you, and mm. you reflect your culture. So you, mm. you you reflect it in the way that you present yourself. And yes, so I agree. It becomes, you know, individual, it becomes part of the culture, not but even just Yeah, and it's even that thing of being influenced by America but still holding our own identity at the same time yeah, as well. Absolutely. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah really well. important actually. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> Especially at the moment. <laughs> totally. yeah. Let's not go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I'm kind of curious to go down that rabbit hole, but perhaps oh, not. Well, perhaps yeah. not. <laughs> no, look, I, I mean, I, I think um, you know, when you, you it's, it sort of crosses over a bit with sustainability that if you want to have um, a, you, you want an architecture that reflects a place, you know, a place, a mm. time, a culture. And that's mm. part of a sustainable kind of design as well. 
Mm, I agree. Mm. I hope that is a great answer to your lovely question. I'm just, oh, and she responded in real time. Thank you, Stacey. Yeah. You were on top of it. It was actually a really intelligent answer. <laughs> 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 me. Um, thank you so much. There's been some really great questions. I now have Linda working behind in the background who she has been deciding what you didn't know. Is she has been deciding which person has the best question. Linda, do you want to bring the best question? up on screen and that I can see her beavering away to decide which one she thinks is the best question. <laughs> I think that's a great question. So Stacy, what we yep. need you to do is uh, email Lyndon with your uh, address and we will pop into the post a very fabulous Hendrix gin pack um, for winning the best question. We will send, um, pop the email address up on screen in a sec, which is gallery at lindenarts.com and you can, oh, sorry, .org, and you can um, send us your details in and we will pop in the post to you or you can come and collect it from the gallery when we're allowed to reopen. Um, I want to thank you both, Minnie and Anna, for joining us today on a very fun conversation. Uh, Stacey's very excited. I feel like her summer's just got a whole lot better <laughs> in terms of her, of her um, Hendrix gym pack. Thank you so much for our um, presenters today. Minnie, it has been lovely to hear your story because it's mm. quite a painful and yet beautiful story for your story in your world of drag and thank you for sharing it. It was lovely to see your performance. Mm. And as I was saying to you before, my grandmother would have said great pair of pins, mini, and I'm quite <laughs> jealous of those very long legs because they're very gorgeous. You can thank my mother for those as well. <laughs> <laughs> I shall. Um, and Anna, thank you so much um, for sharing all your incredible knowledge um, about architecture and furniture. It is. It was so gorgeous to hear about the history coming from Europe and then kind of spreading across the world. Mm -hmm. And I think Everyone who lives in Australia has an element of mid-century modern in their lives oh, in terms absolutely. of the way that they yeah. live. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'd also like to thank our two interpreters, Mark, who appears on the screen now, and Paul, mm, who has also you. been interpreting today. It's been lovely to have you um, share the, the conversation. Um, thank you also to Linda Spudena, who is our Events and Community Engagement Coordinator, and she's been DJing behind the screens, bringing up PowerPoints, bringing in video and responding to some of the conversations that we've been seeing live in Facebook and on YouTube. I'd now like to thank the team also at Melbourne Fringe Festival, some of whom I know have joined us today, and our fabulous design supporters who have made this event possible. I'd like to thank the City of Port Phillip, Creative Victoria, the Naomi Milgram Foundation, the Victorian, the Victorian Women's Trust, and the Education Program Partner for Design Fringe, Monash University. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. It has been lovely to have you with us and we look forward to welcoming you back to the gallery, we hope, very soon. Um, we're due to open, fingers crossed, if the road map um, <laughs> goes as it should, um, we'll be opening the gallery in early November. So it'll be lovely to be able to see people back in the gallery. Minnie, you're already about to hit out of lockdown yeah. in Sydney. Well, I'm sort of scared at the same time. I'm, I'm not rushing out, I can tell you that much. I can let them, I'll let them go first and see what happens. <laughs> Good luck, Minnie. Stay yeah, well and stay you. safe as you re-emerge into a new life. Um, thank you thank so you. much, Anna. You'll be in lockdown with us for a little bit longer. I know. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for joining oh, us thank today. You. Uh, and we'll see experience. you all soon. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Very the Brady Bunch, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs>